start on a slightly low point, I do think that we are in a time of crisis for Christianity. Um, and I think it is sort of existential. I don't think Christianity is going to disappear completely, um, certainly not in other parts of the world. Um, and even in, in this part of the world, I don't think it will completely. But um, it's declining it's in, in such a way that I think it is time to think about things from the bottom up, to really try and get a new sense of what it might mean to be as Christian as an individual, and also what it might mean for the church to present Christianity. And it's through this chap, Owen Barfield, that I found one kind of approach to that, which I'm hoping to put across in as, as, as full a manner as I can this evening, um, so that you, know, you don't just sort of hear the argument, but I hope sort of feel it a bit in your boots, feel it a bit in your soul. Um, and um, if it's true, you know, that we live in a time of crisis for Christianity, um, it is, was also my crisis very much um, over 20 years, 30 years now even, um, of trying to wrestle with Christianity and particularly what this figure of Jesus really means and meant. Um, and I think it's also a crisis for our culture as well. So this is not just about you as an individual Christian, the church, um, but also um, particularly the Western world, which I think has almost completely lost its ability to see with spiritual eyes. Um, we live in a very, very flat world now. Um, and I think that this has all sorts of ramifications for the world in which we live, from the absolutely enormous mental health crisis which barely, barely ever gets really reported. Um, I, I was talking with someone the other day, and they reckon that um, well over half the people who live in a city like this can't get through the week without some kind of drug, whether it's prescribed or not. And that's to say nothing of people who are getting prescription drugs to help them with identifiable diagnostic mental health crises. It's absolutely enormous. Um, and of course, also the spiritual crisis that then feeds into our economic um, uh, crises like around climate change, um, I even think that Brexit's got something to do with it, because it seems to me that when you lose sight of what Augustine called the city of God, you overload politics. It's got to save you politics. And when you feel that it's not, um, you've got nowhere else to go. And that escalates into the situation which we find ourselves in now. So I do actually think this is really very serious. I hope there'll be a few lighter moments in the talk as well. But um, Christianity has got something to say, but I think it's got to change its message quite substantially to do so. Because the other thing which I've noticed as someone who tries to write and give talks is that the vast majority of people in this country now, when you mention Christianity, they spontaneously pull back. They don't want to know um, and uh, if they've even got some sense of what Christianity is. And I think there's, there's key um, issues in that which uh, we've got to learn and, and reflect upon. Um, broadly speaking, I think it's because people don't see Christianity as something that is going to facilitate their growth and development, their flourishing, their expansion as human beings, um, and also um, their expansion as people who uh, live in a spiritual world as well um, and can know the divine as well as know themselves and know others. Um, so, um, you know, from the roots up, I think this needs some kind of uh, to rethink. Now, as I was saying, um, it's this chap, Owen Barfield, who's really helped me. Hopefully this is where the slides work. Yeah, so here we are, Owen Barfield. So a little bit of, about him. Um, he was born in 1898 when Queen Victoria was still on the throne. He died when Tony Blair had become Prime Minister. Um, so he saw quite a lot of life. And he was a member of this Inklings group, um, the most famous members of which are C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien. And the fourth person in that bunch there at the bottom is Charles Williams, who's a bit like Barfield in that he has a kind of cult following, but isn't so well known otherwise. Um, and um, they met together in Oxford, formed this Inklings group, read out what they were working on. And both Lewis and Tolkien said that Barfield had the most incisive and innovative ideas. But Barfield wasn't such a good writer, um, and, uh, whereas Lewis and Tolkien are genius writers in their own way. But once you understand something about Barfield, I think you see how he deeply, deeply um, inspired both Lewis and Tolkien um, and uh, so that particularly with Tolkien, actually, I think, really got it. And the figures, for example, in The Lord of the Rings, you see starting to reflect the different uh, qualities of consciousness um, that Barfield was on about. And this was his kind of key message, was that um, human consciousness, by which he meant our perception of what it is to be ourselves, to relate to others, to relate to nature, to the cosmos, to the gods, or to God, profoundly shifts over time, um, so that uh, the, the experience we have now, the world we view which we have in that, live in now, has dramatically changed from, say, certainly 3,000 years ago, 
which was the time span that he looked at. And he looked at that time span because that was the, um, the time span there is for the, to be literature, um, particularly religious literature. Hey, do take a seat. Religious literature. Um, and his, his, sort of, uh, his way into all this sense that consciousness evolves was by looking at words and how words change meaning. Um, and the key idea he had was that if the way that we use words now reflects the meaning we give to them, of course, our minds, our experience of life, our consciousness. So you can use words as what he called fossils of consciousness to track back over time how things have changed and recover the sense of difference and shift. Now let me give you just one quick example, which I hope will spring out to you straight away, if that sounds a bit abstract. If you think of the Greek word pneuma, it works for in the, the Hebrew ruach as well, but it's particularly interesting with the Greek pneuma, um, which we now have to translate as either breath, wind, or spirit. We have to kind of make a choice. But if you read a text like John 3, 8, very famous uh, part of John's Gospel, um, which now is translated as something like the wind blows where it wills, no one knows where it's coming from, where it's going, so it is with the spirit. Um, the two words wind and spirit in that text are actually the same word, pneuma, and Barford reflected very much upon this and thought that this must say that what we now take to be either something sort of intangible, immaterial, spirit, something a bit intermediate in between, breath, or something external, material, and objective, wind, that difference didn't exist to the person who first wrote the pneuma blows where it wills, and so it is with the life of the pneuma. They weren't using wind as a metaphor of spirit. They were experiencing that same kind of sense um, in both, um, well, they weren't even both senses. It was the one, the one meaning, the one sense. Now, Barfield tracked this over um, you know, thousands of words. Um, he wasn't the only person to do this. This was actually quite a, a, a common um, understanding about how words change meaning in the 19th century. A very great diversity of uh, scholars had noticed this. Um, it's fallen out of fashion in the 20th because history now isn't, people don't like history that has some sort of meaning that's unfolding. They just like history as sort of one thing after another. Um, the kind of, I think of it as a who up, who's down kind of history. Um, that's, that's the way it's told, rather than to tr try and see some sort of deeper meaning. But people like Barfield did come up with deeper meanings. And his broad sense runs like this. He argued that um, about, say, 3,000 years ago, so this is the time of Homer in the Greek world, um, the time of the kings, David and Solomon, say, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and you can track it back in other parts of the world. I'll focus on the Mediterranean this evening, just for sake of clarity. Um, he argued that there, life has experienced what he called original participation. So participation just means how you experience life, how you participate in life, whether it be with yourself, others, nature, cosmos, gods. Um, and he argued that broadly, this experience back then was thoroughly immersive, and in particular, your sense of yourself came from the outside in. Um, we naturally think of our sort of sense of self coming from the inside out. But back then, he argued, it was experienced on the outside in. And I'm going to try and draw out what difference that made. Um, he said that then what happens is there's a kind of cycle that gets going with consciousness. And there are phases where this sense of life coming from the outside in withdraws. And people get a sense of alienation. They get a sense of lostness. And civilizations and individuals go through periods of crisis. And there's both a downside and an upside to this. The downside is the alienation, the sense of meaning falling away, the sense of connection that always was assumed to be there. This kind of flow um, of spirit and wind and breath, you might say, starts to break up and fragment. Um, but it has an upside, which is a crucial part of the evolution of consciousness too, which is that when you suffer from alienation, you have to fall back on yourself. You have no choice. And that, all being well enough, intensifies the sense of individuality, it increases the sense of self, so that the individual starts to be born as we think of ourselves now. And then what can happen, it's not an automatic process, but what can happen is what Barfield called either reciprocal participation or final participation. And this is the sense that the richness of your own inner life can start to reflect the richness of um, the rest of the world, nature, cosmos, God, um, and so, whilst your sense of self comes from the inside out, it is where lands on reality, reality speaks back to you, and there's a rich sense of being alive and meaning once more. So what I'm going to do now is sort of try and tell how that cycle has sort of come and gone 
about one and a half times over the last 3,000 years, why Christianity is so pivotal, and the figure of Jesus particularly is so pivotal to this cycle. Um, hopefully you'll get a much more of a, a better feel for it as well, through lots of very familiar stories in the Bible. Um, and it'll chart, start to speak to where we are now, and what this might mean for where we are now. So, cast your mind back, as it were, to even pre-Bible, to the Egyptians. Um, if you know anything about uh, the Hebrew Bible, you'll know that the Egyptians are broadly speaking the bad guys. Um, uh, Israel felt it needed to escape from Egypt. And I think this is a spiritual um, a truth as much as anything else, um, that Egypt, as it were, was thoroughly immersed in an older consciousness that the people of Israel started to get fidgety about. They wanted to be free from. Um, remember that uh, Egypt is a civilization started about 4,000 years ago, if not before. So even at the time of Jesus, it was very, very ancient, 2,000 years old or more. Um, so it represents, as it were, where they're coming from um, and, uh, and they're, by contrast, where they might be going. And it's a thoroughly pan pantheistic culture. Um, it's always uh, many gods. Here you can see an individual um, standing before many gods. And when you ask yourself, you know, what might that be about? What might it be to live in a kind of pantheistic culture? You get a clue when you also notice that in lots of Egyptian iconography, body parts often float free. So here's a very famous body fl part that floats free. This is the Eye of Horus. Um, and, but noses, legs, stomachs, um, various bits of body parts float, float free in hieroglyphics and in Egyptian art. And I think what's going on here is this... It's a representation of this sense of life coming from the outside in rather than from the inside out. That there's no gathered sense of being an individual back then. Rather, different parts of your body and your soul, um, by extension, were connected to different deities. And that in order to have a gathered sense of yourself, you needed to relate to this pantheon of gods to bring it all together. You know, so that different gods demanded different things from you, and there were different rites and rituals, whether they be civic or individual, different libations, different magical rites, different spells even. Um, and that by performing and being immersed in this pantheistic culture, these various body parts gathered into your sense of self. So you knew your eye, as it were, is somehow connected to Horus. It makes some sense because Horus is a dying and rising god. And so seeing, as it were, um, is a, a kind of dying and rising activity. When you see something, it's like something's awoken to you, risen before your eyes, you might say. So it makes some sense to us still. Um, but it was a very different experience of life, I think, um, this outside in consciousness. Um, you see, I think, I, most vividly, I think, in the pyramids. This isn't the way Barfield did it. This is partly my sort of illustration to try and get the ideas across. But what I found so fascinating about pyramids is that we quite naturally and spontaneously think of pyramids now to describe our inner life. If you know anything about psychology, you'll know about Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where he describes the needs that human beings have in the shape of a pyramid. And at the base are the basic needs of security, um, uh, uh, food, sustenance, and so on. They grow up through things like relationships, friendships, that kind of thing. And then right at the top, at the pinnacle, at the peak, is self-actualization. And he describes it in a sort of pyramidal shape. But I think back then, the reason why the early Egyptian civilizations, uh, um, epochs anyway, went in for um, pyramid building, which we know they did voluntarily, it wasn't slave labor, that's been shown now, um, is because it was a meaningful task for the whole of society. And that it gathered together um, the sense of self in the figure of the pharaoh, um, beneath, as it were, which everybody had a sense of place. Um, so mu much as we might, as it were, you know, go on a pilgrimage or embark on some sort of, sort of psychological enterprise to discover our sense of self, rise, as it were, higher up the pyramid and discover something of our self-actualization, this was done in, it wasn't just a building task, of course, it was a completely spiritual task, but it was an external task of building the pyramids. Now, the Israelites start to get itchy about this. I think it, it unfolds, actually, in Egyptian history, too, um, which I could say more about later. Um, but... What's so fascinating is I think the oldest parts of the Hebrew Bible carry echoes of this transition. So here's a very, very famous uh, an image, a very, very famous story, Caravaggio's depiction of Abraham about to kill Isaac um, and being told by the angel not to because there's a ram in the thicket. Now we now, when we read this story, wrestle with it. It, it seems um, morally terrible to us, actually. We cannot begin to understand how someone um, could perform this act because they've been told to by God. 
But that's because we have a moral conscience, which didn't really exist back then. Rather, the gods appear, or an angel, a messenger from God, um, and that's how people experienced um, the crisis that led Abraham not to slay Isaac, in fact, and to slay um, the ram instead. So this story, I think, gets, mem- gets remembered because it becomes a kind of pivotal story um, uh, that people can know what, what, as it were, was the case and what, what might be the case now because it becomes a kind of horrific story. It, it, it forces you to rethink itself, which, of course, forces you to rethink your own consciousness, your own experience, and what might be required of you now. I think you see it in other stories as well. Um, here's a particularly... Uh, amazing one, brilliant one, the story of Jacob, another of the patriarchs. So we're talking again about very ancient traditions in the Hebrew Bible. Um, Jacob wrestling with the angel overnight. And again, the the climax of the story, as you'll no doubt know, is this incredibly moving sentence where he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Um, This is experienced as a kind of literal fight, the sign of which is that his hips put out of joint. And yet he's wrestling with the angel saying, I will not let you go till you bless me. Again, I think it's a story that got remembered because it's a different kind of consciousness. Um, and of course, Jacob gets called Israel um, after this. Um, he has an ex- a theophany that re- means he's got to change his name. Something tangible has to change to him. Um, and just in parenthesis, you know that when Moses, for example, has his theophany, he doesn't have to change his name. And I think it's a sign because something changes inside rather than something from the outside. Barfield enables you to start to reflect on these stories in deeper and deeper ways. Here's another image from very old traditions in the Bible. This is one of the, um, the uh, de- depiction of one of the wars that the tribal, probably tribe of Israel, uh, against other Canaanites, and when they set out, uh, you know, the, so- the songs of Miriam um, and-, and other very ancient traditions, I think, in the Hebrew Bible, and they experience it not just as the soldiers going out to fight. But they experience it as Mount Zion fighting for them. Rivers and streams take part in the battle. As it were, the heavenly hosts descend and take part in the battle too. And I think this is another manifestation of life from the outside in. Um, that um, you didn't actually, as it were, pluck up your courage, and which is a very internal um, kind of capacity to have. Um, the gods themselves came down um, and fought with you. Um, you see this... In, in, in all Egyptian battles are depicted in the same way too. Um, even in Homer, it's said in the same way. Um, that, for example, Achilles, the great a hero of Iliad, he has to fight the gods of the rivers as much as he does um, uh, the actual other warriors and so on. And similarly too with Achilles, um, when he um, decides not to strike Agamemnon dead in one of his rages, for example, he doesn't have a crisis of conscience. The god Athena appears and literally pulls back his head and stops him from doing it. So these are, these are stories which have just about survived into our, our, our civilization because of the written word that Barfield reflected upon and painted a picture of a different sense of consciousness which people had. Here's another image which I hope captures another aspect of this which is going to become pivotal in Christianity. And this is an image from Gustave Doré's depiction of Dante actually travelling across the River Styx. But what I really like about this is that um, it captures, I think, the older sense of what life and death was. That... Back then, um, no one really aspired to have an individual afterlife. Instead, both in Greek and actually Hebrew culture, the standard hope was that you return to your ancestors. So in the Bible, for example, you know, when the kings die and they were buried with their ancestors. And being buried in ancestral ground was absolutely crucial um, for this because, as it were, your life peaked during your mortal life from ancestral life and then returned to the life from whence it had come. Um, that was the sort of the sense of, of dying and rising. And when um, occasionally, particularly in Greek culture, but also there's a few stories like this in the Hebrew Bible, individuals in this life go to the underworld because they want to meet someone they know as an individual in this life. It always ends in the most disturbing way when they see their former friend, as it were, spluttering into the shades and returning to the ancestral ground um, whence they come from. Um, it happens, uh, particularly when, uh, one of the best stories is the Witch of Endor story. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, where um, uh, Saul um, is called up and just sort of splutters away. I'm not sure I've got the right person. Solomon and Saul it is, isn't it? But anyway, you take the point. It splutters away. This is, I think, a very ancient story, remembering this old sense of life and death. You have to have a sense of being an individual, a gathered consciousness, in order to even hope for an afterlife, let alone start to know what that might be like. And the proposal is that didn't really exist back then. Now, this starts to change. Um, I want to look particularly at how it started to change 
in the Hebrew Bible, the, the evidence from the Hebrew Bible, which Barfield draws out, and in my book I particularly investigated this because I wanted to know whether it really stacks up with biblical scholarship that's happened more recently. And the pivotal period, which this is very standard biblical scholarship now, is that the periods around the two exiles in Hebrew um, history were crucial. Something very dramatically changed in Judaism then. Um, broadly, the story is that um, uh, the great kingdoms around this sort of small kingdom of Israel and Judah um, threatened Israel and Judah. First of all, Israel was conquered. Then there was a period of a few, a few decades, and then Judah was con conquered and Famously, Judah was then led into exile in Babylon by the rivers of Babylon where they, they sat down and wept. But whilst there's the kind of external history, inside that, um, almost as an accidental byproduct, was some, something else was unfolding that turned out to be far, far more substantial um, for um, Israel, for um, the Jews. And I think it's actually the reason why Judaism survived the exile. First of all, what happened is that after the kingdom of Israel fell, King Hezekiah is on the throne. And he sees this as kind of his chance to build up um, the city-state of Jerusalem. And before this period, it had been um, a rather small town um, in a sort of hilly part of um, Israel, um, which is the reason why um, it wasn't conquered. Um, and, um, but he sees this as a chance, uh, partly because there's a lot of refugees coming down from the northern kingdom. They flood into Ju Jerusalem, starts to build up the city. But what he has to do is to work out how to hold this people together spiritually and religiously. And so he starts to write down the old myths, the old stories that had previously been rehearsed in the sacred grounds and that people now couldn't access anymore because uh, the place had been conquered. Um, and so it's, it's, it's known that this is where the sort of precursors to the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, first start getting written down. And what's even more brilliant when I was doing the research is that I also re discovered that um, literacy rates shoot up in this period um, in between the exiles from almost nothing, a few scribes as it were, to about 20% of the population. They know there's some artefacts that have been, have been discovered. Um, so suddenly a lot of people are reading. And if you think about it, when you read a story, that completely changes your relationship to the story and your, the consciousness that's required to understand the meaning of the story. Um, because rather than it being a sort of oral tradition that flows through you, that you feel because you visited the place with all your ancestors, with the rites going on and so on, it's kind of given you to from the outside in. To read is to have an inner struggle to try and make the words wake up for you once again so they have meaning. So reading for Hezekiah was about keeping the stories alive to try and keep this expanding sitting state sort of in some sort of order and control. But it has this unexpected byproduct that people's interiority starts to deepen and develop because of reading. It happens in another way, which is um, that for the first time, people start to be buried in small family tombs and sometimes even individual tombs as well. And the point being is they weren't buried anymore in the old ancestral grounds. Um, again, you know, there's a lot of archaeology supporting this now. Um, and again, when you think about it, this dramatically changes perhaps the most pivotal moment of your life after your birth, your death and what's going to happen. You can no longer rely on the ancestors being there to greet you because you're no longer being buried in the ancestral ground. You have to start to work out your own immortality for yourself. Um, I think it probably would have been terrifying, very, very difficult. Um, but nonetheless, again, you start getting the sense through this process of withdrawal, alienation, struggle, a new consciousness starts to emerge. And I think the practice of having individual burials starts to um, play a pivotal role in this. Now, what happens is that now what's called the Deuteronomic reform starts to get onto this, I think. So this is particularly in between the periods of the exiles. So Israel's fallen, Judah hasn't yet. So this is all a bit confusing. It's all in the book. Um, but uh, the Deuteronomic reform takes place, which is a major reform of, of Hebrew texts, um, Hebrew stories. Again, very standard biblical scholarship now. Um, but what particularly the Deuteronomic form does, is it shifts attention from the patriarchs, from Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, onto Moses. And suddenly Moses becomes the central figure, the central transitional object, as we psychotherapists say, through which the people of Judah could start to think about themselves. And here he is in an icon depicted um, before the burning bush. Um, I've already... Uh, told you that when he had his theophany, unlike Jacob's theophany, he didn't have to change his name. He ha you might say he had to become more of himself, not become a different person. And what the Deuteronomic reform does, it does many, many things actually um, to, to, uh, to Judaism, but particularly in the figure of Moses, it makes it absolutely clear that he is not a king. 
he is not a figure tied to place. So if you know the story of Moses, you know that when he almost gets into the promised land, having led the people away from the old consciousness of Egypt, he dies. And it says, and no one knows to this day where he's buried. He's not returning to the ancestors. Something else is happening now. He doesn't even get to the promised land. He's never going to become a king. The whole point, you might say, is the journey through the wilderness. We would say that now with a, the more developed sense of this. But I think that these, these key changes which uh, the Deuteronomics uh, made to the story of Moses are absolutely pivotal. I think they were onto it. They knew that the new spirituality was being called forth. Um, there's a lot more I could say about this. It'd be, I think it had been anticipated by the early prophets, particularly Amos and Hosea and Isaiah. Um, you know, broadly, their message was, you haven't got God, but we don't know what God is yet and led them in, people into crisis. So they were the kind of four in, the, in the, the, uh, the vanguard of this change. The Deuteronomists turn it into a sort of spiritual program um, that we now call the Book of Deuteronomy and others, um, that isn't just about the stories of Moses, but the law gets changed in ways, again, that sort of cultivate the individual. What, one really good example of this is that where before um, the sins of the fathers had been seen to fall upon the children to the fourth generation, um, very standard in an outside-in kind of consciousness. It happens in lots of different cultures. Deut the Deuteronomists and also Jeremiah specifically say, no, the sins will not fall upon the children anymore. There's a rather beautiful phrase that Je Jeremiah uses where he says, um, the parents will taste of the bitter um, lemon or something and the children will, will taste of sweet honey. Um, what the parent, what's happened to the parents doesn't happen to the children anymore. Um, I, I sort of tracked these out through Deuteronomy in my book to show that Deuteronomy, I think, is not just the kind of law, this is how you should live, I and mean, it's almost like a spiritual exercise that you grapple with in order to try to work on earth it's trying to show you. And the reason why you have to grapple with it is because your consciousness has to change to get it. You can't just be told, because otherwise you, you won't get it in the old consciousness, you have to change. And it's sometimes very, very brutal. Um, you know, in Deuteronomy it says, if your brother tells you what to do, stone your brother. If your parent tells you what to do, stone your parents. And I think Jesus picked up on this when he said, let the dead bury their dead. You know, don't follow your family anymore. Don't follow these old traditions. Something new has got to happen. Um, I don't think it's meant literally, actually, myself, but I think that the ferocity of the, of the saying is saying something about the, the profundity of the shift that's being demanded and asked. Now, very, very quickly, um, because I think that by the time we get to Jesus, um, Judaism has become Hellenistic Judaism, not biblical Judaism, and that in itself is kind of a whole story. But a similar unfolding was taking place in the Greek world. Um, you can look at it in terms of the philosophy of the Greek world, um, the playwrights of the Greek world, but just to give you a sense of it, because it's very, very vivid, um, in the art of the Greek world. And within about 100 years, Greek sculptures change completely. So it's a, maybe a central to after the period of the exile, or the, 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 um, when, when, the, when the Hebrew people are taken to exile, it's maybe 100 or so years later. But within 100 years, sculpture moves from these kind of images, um, a, a figure of a male and a female, um, they're known as the Kuroi and Kors, um, and they are archetypal figures, we would say. You know, this is not Jim and Jane from around the corner. Um, they're, they're sculpted according to sacred ratios, um, all the, um, the distances between parts of the body are absolutely standard right across Greece, in fact in Egypt as well. Um, these are figures which, as it were, they're a male archetype that speaks to you from the outside in, that calls forth something for you as a man but not to be an individual. It starts to change about 30, by 30 years later, and this is in the 5th century BC, you start to see figures who are looking more like individuals. So like this chap on the left now, he has been to the gym. That's quite evident. He's not been sculpted according to sacred ratios anymore. And his knees bent, which is why it snapped off, and his arms too, I think, must have been holding the tools of his trade, more of a sense of being an individual, which is why they too have snapped off. Um, similar things there uh, with, the, with the figure of the female. And then just a few decades later, you come to what we now think of as the sort of pinnacle of Greek art, where you have the fam very famous Im image of Discobulus by Myron, and then this is a queen, um, a Hellenistic queen, very influenced by Greek sculpture. Um, and see, the point about the Discobulus there is not that this is a beautiful man throwing the discus, but this is a man whose mental poise is as much a part of his ability to throw the discus in a genius way as anything else. And when you look at it, the felt experience is of a man who's gone to go on a kind of psychological training as much as um, a physical training. And similarly with the Hellenistic queen there, you know, her absolute her ravishing beauty depicted there um, is supposed to speak to you of her presence as a person, as a soul, 
as much as, um, as a sort of object. I don't think it's really supposed to be an object at all. She's supposed to dazzle you with a kind of heavenly beauty um, that's coming from within her person now, not from the outside in. And these, these sculptures, when they were first made, they, people hated them. Um, they were called uh, wizards and witches, the people that made them, because people didn't know how to respond to them. But luckily, enough people realised that something very new and, and profound was being conveyed to them through the sculptures, also through the playwrights and, and through the philosophers as well. Remember, Socrates gets put to death. Um, the people at the time couldn't tolerate him, but luckily, just enough people could, so his method gets remembered and gets transmitted to us. The sense of being an individual after the struggle, the crisis, that the old way has fallen away. So, we're now into the Hellenistic period, maybe the two or three centuries before Jesus. This is another part of my book, actually, which uh, was quite a discovery for me, because when I did my theology back in the 1980s, we didn't really talk much about this period. Um, but all sorts of things are fully flourishing in the century or so before Jesus, which are barely mentioned in the Bible. We, we're quite inclined to read them back into the Bible now, but they're not really there. One of them is apocalypticism. Um, this really gets going um, in the two or three centuries before Jesus. Um, I think it gets going because... The individual now profoundly matters. And if the individual matters, how is it that the bad seem to live well in life, whereas the good suffer and get killed? So the idea comes that God must be returning in some way to right all wrongs, um, so that the good individual gets taken up to heavenly glory with God, um, and the bad finally get their comeuppance. Um, this, this doesn't actually just get going in the Hebrew world, it gets going in the Greek world too. Um, another thing which uh, is all the way through the New Testament, isn't once mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, are synagogues, um, a, he a Hellenistic Jewish invention. And I think they matter because this is about individual learning. This is the place where you go to in your town, you study the Torah, um, and you develop as a good Jew. You don't even really have to bother with the temple in Jerusalem very much. And in fact, quite a lot of Jewish sects at the time of Jesus didn't much bother with the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, after the return from the exile, when Cyrus rebuilt the temple, it took several hundred years for enough Jews to really get back to Judah to form the, the, the nation state again. Um, and in fact, many didn't. Many went back to Egypt and so on because they carried a new sense of themselves. So synagogues, too, I think, were another key sign that something very dramatic had happened. So what you have is this growing sense that um, to be an individual was uh, a, a crucial part of what it was to experience yourself as a, as a Jew um, or as a Greek um, and to, to know about your relationship with, with God, with Yahweh, who by this time has become the monotheistic God Yahweh. And um, again, this kind of like unfolds through the Hebrew Bible, quite standard biblical criticism now. It's reckoned that there isn't full-on monotheism until what's now known as Deutero-Isaiah, um, where doesn't just say Yahweh is one God amongst many gods, but says Yahweh is God alone. Um, and this completely makes sense, I think, with Barfield's understanding, because if you think about it, you can't appreciate the unity of the deity unless you have enough gathered sense of your own self, as it were, your I amness has to be formed enough in order to appreciate the I am revelation of God, which no doubt had come before, but didn't really make sense until this period, I think. So you have this growing expectation um, that somehow the individual now can relate to the divine. And I think this is why Jesus comes at this point in time. He comes as it were when the time is right, because people see in him the complete fulfilment of what had been unfolding in previous centuries. That this person who was absolutely and totally fully human was also absolutely and totally transparent to the divine. So much so that people felt God's presence when they were with him. Brilliantly captured um, in this very famous icon um, of Jesus from Mount Sinai. I love it because um, if you think about it, where Jesus there is holding the book, you might say that's the kind of physical bit in the world. You know, books are tangible objects. It moves up in a slight swirl to his hand giving the blessing, an intermediate state. Moves up into his face, which famously has one eye bigger than the other. There's the human eye, which is slightly smaller, and the divine eye, which is slightly bigger. This is a person who's seeing both with mortal and immortal eyes. And then sweeps up um, into the halo, which, um, when you see the original, is written with hot own, the one. So, um, you know, this is the, the mortal human um, person being swept up into the divine, um, completely in the person of Jesus that's characterised in this, in this uh, icon. Now... So Jesus arrives, you might say, and has to convey this to people. And it's still quite a hard task. Um, and I think, as it were, first of all, he tries it out in his teaching. And this is where um, one of the 
um, the things I think it's really got to change for the way that the gospel is taught um, uh, in the church now, certainly as I've experienced it anyway, you know, from my own training and so on. Um, here's Jesus uh, teaching uh, on the, 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 uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount. I don't think that Jesus' moral teaching was that distinctive. I don't think, actually, that it was that uh, distinctive to say, uh, love your enemies as well as your friends. Socrates said as much. I don't actually myself think it was that distinctive to say, look after the poor. Um, the Greeks did it, the Romans did it. You know, remember that to be a Roman citizen, the two things that got you were circuses and bread. You got fed. It was like the kind of uh, the welfare state. No doubt it had its failings, which is why there, were always, there was always room for small groups to pick up the people that, di- that fell through the net, we'd say. Um, but I don't think that care for the poor um, was a distinctive feature of Christianity. It was sort of standard morality by this time, which is why it's in the Gospel, but isn't distinctive. What I think is distinctive of Jesus, and again, in my book I try and do this sort of scholarship to make this stand up, um, are three things. First of all, Jesus teaches in parables. Um, there's 40 or more parables recorded. No one else, like Paul, teaches in parables. It seems to have been distinctive to Jesus. And I think the key thing we have to remember now about parables is they're not moral tales. It's too easy for us to reduce them to moral tales, except when you go to church, like on last Sunday, and the gospel is the gospel of the unjust steward, and it makes absolutely no moral sense at all. In fact, it's completely amoral, and you wonder what on earth's going on. But if you put that to one side, something else, I think, can come to the fore. And this is how it was um, described in the medieval period, um, that a parable works on four levels. Um, First of all, it works on the literal level, the sort of letter meaning of the story. And sometimes you think you've got it at that level, like the Good Samaritan seems pretty obvious. Be good like the Good Samaritan, not like the bad priests. Um, But um, if you just stick there, um, this reading says, you're not going to get the proper meaning. You have to move to the allegorical meaning, which literally means the other meaning. Now, in the, in the parables like the unjust stewards, you, you're, not let, you're not allowed to rest at the literal meaning. You have to go to this other meaning, this start to go on a quest. And what happens is that you reach a sort of tropological moment, as it was called. Tropos, like the, the tropics, the turning points. Um, and this is where the struggle with the parable starts to elicit a new kind of awareness. I think the way that, that, that this happens most commonly with parables is you start to feel the energy of the parable rather than the literal meaning. So take the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, you start to realise that something else must have been going on for the Good Samaritan. Um, and then, if you do a bit of Greek study, particularly this comes up, um, the turning point is when you realise that the, the point about the Good Samaritan is he was free. He was utterly free to respond in the moment to the chap in the ditch. Um, he could give his money away, he wasn't worried about that. Um, he no doubt was a religious man, the Samaritans were religious too, but he was free with that. You know, man was made for the Sabbath, not for the Sabbath for man, and so on. He was free. And when you get that in the parables, the energy of the parable, that too is the point where a conversion might take place. So you move then to the anagogic, as it was called, which is the ascending meaning, the meaning that is of the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdom of this world. Um, so I think parables had to be taught in very, very different ways, really. Um, It's all about how it's converting you, how it's changing you through the wrestle, rather than reducing them to moral tales, um, which um, often don't stack up, but even when they do, lose their richness, lose their spirit to change things. That's one distinctive feature of Jesus' teaching, I think. A second is um, his focus on interiority. Um, Again, this is now fairly standard biblical scholarship that Jesus seems to have focused on interiority in a way that no other teachers at the time did. So he says, for example, when you pray, go into your room, and when you shut the door, pray to your father who's in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Then it'll be manifest. If you do the inner work, then it'll be manifest. And the word secret appears quite a lot in the Gospel, which is why part of my book is called The Secret History of Christianity. And there's only one prayer, actually, which Jesus gives that's in the plural, that's as a word for the collective, rather than for the individual to struggle and wrestle with themselves. It's the most famous prayer of all, Our Father, Um, But all the other prayers that Jesus gives are for the individual to wrestle with themselves. You know, and all these rather bizarre sayings like, pluck out your eye, don't let your left hand know what the right's doing, and so on. That's the interiority that I think this is pointing towards. Um, Another way in which he does this, which seems rather odd, um, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, that defiles a man. Um, He's preoccupied, Jesus, quite often with what's coming in and what's coming out. And always what he's saying to you, it's not what you take in that matters anymore. It's what comes out of you that matters. Now, no doubt this is partly a literal thing to do with uh, rituals and rites and so on. Um, But I think, of course, it's got a spiritual meaning too. And it's what comes out from inside you, not just following the old outside-in rules that really counts. 
And then I think it's the most common phrase that Jesus uses actually in the Gospels, um, which is this, this sort of riff on, have you got eyes to see? Have you got ears to hear? It comes up time and time and time again. Here's it in the, bless, in the, in the positive form. Blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears because they hear. Constantly in the parables, interiority, and then in, in, in this phrase as well, he's saying, have you got the eyes to see? Do you get it? Do you get it? That's, I think, his key kind of teaching message. It comes up again in a, in a third way. This is a bit more controversial, but this is what I reckon happened. Um, and I'm, it's not just me, other biblical scholars have said this, but it is a moot point. But I think Jesus also reforms the apocalypticism of the time. If you think that in the Hellenistic period, the idea that God was going to return in some way, a Messiah was going to come um, and uh, redeem the righteous and cast out um, the evil ones, I think Jesus said, no, the kingdom is already here. Don't sit around waiting for something to happen from the outside in. You've got to discover it within. And this is one of the places where it's put most forcefully uh, in, the, in the Gospel of Luke. And now when he asked by the Pharisees where the kingdom of God would come, for a standard question from the Pharisees when, God, when God's coming, he answers and says to them, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they see, say, see here, see here, see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, you'll know that in the Gospels uh, and in the book of Revelation, there are um, a lot of apocalyptic passages as well. But these passages are remembered. And I think that they're remembered because people knew Jesus said them, even if they didn't quite get them. Um, they knew they had to be recorded somewhere. Paul, I think, begins to get it through his letters. So in the early letters, like in 1 Thessalonians, he does say, we'll be gathered up in the clouds together. But by his later letters, he's saying, no, the mind of Christ is within me. Um, and he's, he's realising the interiority that's required. He's sort of discovering it after the initial burst of his, of his conversion. Um, and th there's one gospel, of course, where there's no apocalyptic material, which is John's gospel, which also has um, the richest um, developed sense of interiority, so that Jesus can quite explicitly, for example, say, I am this, I am that, I am the other. Um, I think that John's community must have understood this, so John could write a very different gospel, rather than having to write the kind of text which would make people struggle with it. Um, that would be broadly the idea. So I think apocalyptic reform is key. Um, and as an aside, it's quite often said now that Christianity's first was great embarrassment was when Jesus didn't come back. I think Jesus never thought he was going to come back because the kingdom of God is within you. The idea is that Jesus is, is here already in us. But that's slightly to cut to the chase. I'm, I'll come back to that idea. Um, yeah, so here's a, here's a final example of it um, uh, where after the resurrection, um, Mary uh, sees Jesus in the garden and Jesus says to her, Mary, she turns to him and says, Rabboni, which very interestingly means teacher. Um, so in other words, Jesus, she's recognised that Jesus is trying to impart something to her. And then Jesus says, do not cling to me. As it were, now it's time for you to discover the incarnation within you, I think. For I have not yet sent to my father, but I'm going to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father, my God and your God. This is the new moment that John shows in this, this passage, I think. Again, quite fierce, do not cling to me. Um, and yet, I think it's because this is a pivotal moment for Mary where the incarnation can be known in herself and not just in this person that she has known. Now, in the Christian tradition, this becomes quite standard in mystical traditions. So, for example, in Meister Eichhardt, he quite routinely says things like, the incarnation that mattered is not the one that happened before, it's the one that's happening now. Because if it's not happening now in your lived consciousness, your lived experience, what does it matter that it happened 1,500 years ago at his time? Um, so it's the, it's the very standard kind of mystical text now. Um, but it's very hard, I think, for us in the modern world because we've largely lost touch with that mystical tradition. I think it got wrenched out at the time of the Reformation. It's certainly in this country in about 10 years, all the religious houses disappeared. And whilst no doubt many of them were corrupt and sort of, as it were, deserved to be closed, um, this living tradition of what it might mean to know the kingdom of God within you got severely disrupted. Um, and I think that maybe now in our time um, is a time when we need to start um, to rediscover this again. Now, some of you maybe in the room are starting getting a bit nervous, saying, wait a minute, are you going to go around saying you're God or something, or I am this, I am the other? Um, of course, what happens next in the story is that Jesus dies on the cross. Um, and I think this is such a seminal part of the story too, because it's saying that you have to die to yourself in order to know this fuller divine self. Take up your cross and follow me. Paul works it out and starts saying things like, I take up my cross every day, which of course he doesn't do literally, um, but this is the spiritual task, the self-sacrifice, the constant sense of offering the small self, you might say, in order that the large self can come in. 
um, and as has been well observed, I like this, this figure of the crucifixion because it looks so solitary. Um, uh, various people have commented that scenes of solitariness, scenes of crisis, scenes of breakdown, dark night of the soul, the many names it's given, and now become absolutely central to any spiritual journey of any weight. Um, dying to the self um, becomes the way that you start to know, in the Christian terms, that the kingdom of God is within. And then what happens, I think, is you have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. And I particularly like this image of the resurrection uh, uh, because, if you notice, um, the Roman soldiers, um, to cast them in, uh, you know, stereotype them, the resurrection is happening, as it were, right by their ears, and they don't hear a single thing. Uh, you know, it's like bursting with new life and light, and their eyes aren't even open. They haven't got the eyes to see, the ears to hear. But those who have see the resurrection. And I think this is why the resurrection stories in the Gospels are so bizarre. Um, the psychotherapist in me thinks that Jesus was sort of playing peekaboo with the disciples. And if you know from raising children or having done childhood studies, you know that peekaboo is a crucial game because what it does is it means you can take in the presence of the parents even when the, present, the parent's not there. So you pretend, you know, here's a gone boo and the child at first loves it, but develops the interiority to know that God is within them, to know, sorry, to know that the parent is within them. And my, this, is, this is slightly my whimsical reading, but I wonder whether the reason why the resurrection stories are so odd you know, sometimes Jesus is there, sometimes he's not, sometimes he eats, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he's with them, they don't meet him, then they see him, and then they don't see him anymore. It's kind of like spiritual peekaboo, in order that the stories can, for us, cultivate this interiority so that eventually we get the eyes to see, we get the ears to hear. That's something about the resurrection. Now, what happens is we move into a dispensation that Barfield called reciprocal participation, um, the broad scope of Christendom, you might say, up until about 1500. Um, well, I think that this sense of interiority um, meant that uh, at least enough people did have the eyes to see, did have the ears to hear, um, so that a Christian civilization could be sustained uh, with its sort of full life and full spirit. It's, it's a mixed story. It's full of horrors as well. Of course it is. I mean, I think part of the reason why Christianity also becomes very good at inquisitions is because if you're worried about what's going on inside a person, there's always going to be nasty people that are going to as well put you on the rack to find out. So Christianity also becomes particularly suspect to horrors, I think. But nonetheless, um, there is the bright side as well as the shadow. Here's Evagrius Ponticus, um, a very important early church figure who devises the first kind of economy of inner life. Um, he comes up with what now, unfortunately, are called the seven deadly sins. Originally, they were the eight things that you find if you go on this inner journey and that will disturb you, like gluttony, like pride, and so on. But he gives techniques to help you move through this die to yourself in order that you can know um, the full kingdom. It becomes a kind of uh, a first psychology. Very interestingly, when psychotherapy in the 20th century in this country um, really gets going, figures like Melanie Klein come up with a list of, uh, of troubles that your patients will experience when you're working with them that more or less directly match um, the eight difficulties, as Evagoras Ponticus put it. Here's an image as well from this period which captures a lot of this sense. This is a pelican in her piety. It becomes very, very popular. Um, and the reason is, I think, it's because it was seen to work on all these levels. At the one hand, it is a kind of literal image. It was thought that pelicans fed their young by plucking their breast and feeding their young with blood. But it's also a kind of analogical tale. It's a moral tale about how one should live, sacrificing oneself all the time in order that one can know the divine life. Um, and then also it's a story about, it's a story of anagogic importance uh, about the divine too. And um, this is how God's uh, relationship to us uh, is in the world as well and so you can read the book of nature as it was said as well as the book of the bible and the pelican and her party was one very popular way of sort of reminding people of this inner journey they had to go on as well as enjoying the outer stories and images the last gasp of this you might say is with the renaissance where um, and i think this the reason why these renaissance pictures so appeal to us now is because they're they're just full of interiority. Here's a very famous Mona Lisa. You know, people speculate endlessly about who she was, what her mood was, was she smiling, was she upset? Um, there's also the landscape in the background, very standard in these, in these Renaissance images, which too are kind of going on a journey. And um, there's always swirling roads and rivers disappearing to a kind of invisible horizon. You're being invited into something that's both your own interiority and the interiority of the whole world in these images. Um, here's another one that I really like, um, Gelandaya's old man and um, grandson. Um, it's an absolutely particular moment um, between a real man and a real grandson and the, the, the sort of melancholy of their meeting. And if you ask yourself, why did the artist paint that splendidly warty nose right in the middle of the picture? It's to say, this is a real individual 
But it's also a timeless moment. Again, we're reminded of that because through the window there's another windy road, another windy river, and an infinite horizon. The rich interiority of the world that these individuals in their own interiority knew. This reciprocal participation. And it takes on a full-blown mystical form in Christianity too. Here's uh, Hildegard of Bingen with a depiction of one of her uh, visions where she sees man, humanity in man's mind, able to traverse the whole cosmos um, because their interiority completely matches onto the inside of all things. And um, the kind of the, the mystical quest after the cloud of unknowing comes the realisation. So, things are not like that for us now. Let's have a quick mouthful. In between then and now for us has come another kind of rupture that we must grapple with. Um, first rupture will be the scientific revolution. I, I'll just quickly say something about this because it's quite familiar, but broadly speaking, I hope it's depicted in these two images. One is before 1543, which was when Copernicus published um, his um, On the Revolution of the Spheres, and it shows a human figure exploring the world and the cosmos you know, literally in the, in the figure by crawling through it. He's thoroughly immersed in the cosmos in this reciprocal participation, and as a way he can look at the celestial spheres quite as easily as he can look um, at the terrestrial spheres as well. But what happens after Copernicus um, is not, I think, the significance, not wasn't that the sun gets put at the centre of the cosmos. That idea had actually been around for a long, long time. The ancient Greeks talked about it too. But the point was that you couldn't mathematise it at the time, so it can never really stack up. But when the consciousness emerges that the individual as human beings can see themselves outside of the cosmos completely, look onto it with the view from nowhere, objectify the world, then the maths can get going. And so Copernicus can publish his book. So I think the significance of the scientific revolution is actually the shift of consciousness, that human beings see themselves detached from the world. Now, it has the great advantage that science gets going, but it has the great disadvantage that meaning crises start. Um, and how to get back into the world becomes the great struggle. Um, this is particularly picked up at the Reformation, these two figures, Martin Luther and Calvin. Uh, forgive me, Luther and Calvin fans in the room, I'm going to do them a horrible injustice, but I hope it captures something of their spirit. They become deeply suspicious of interior life. Martin Luther says, those allegorical readings, I detest them, I wish I could get them out of my head. Calvin famously says, we are totally depraved inside. We need an objective um, sort of place to rest knowledge of our salvation, which they, they rest on scripture, of course. Um, although it, it sets it up, on, it's an uneasy truce because the authority of scripture is only really known by the individual of reading scripture. So there's this kind of constant uneasy wrestling. It's another withdrawal of participation that the Reformation sets up, um, and which in a way is our inheritance. Every doubt that you've had as a believer comes from this new struggle that the Reformers set up. Um, by saying it's in scripture but it's sort of in yourself as well so now where is it, where are you going to find it the other thing that happens uh, in intellectual life in Europe anyway is the enlightenment where figures like Immanuel Kant appear and say don't trust the old authorities dare to know for yourself have the courage of your own reason calling upon a kind of inner authority which gets going um, in philosophy as well now as I say this has great advantages um, it's got advantages of technology it's got advantages that we value the individual more than ever before in history, and particularly, I think there's more women in the room here tonight, yes. Um, uh, we now say that your individuality completely depends not upon your social standing, not upon your birth, your kin. It depends upon you as an individual, and you can be educated, and as it were, rise up and down society, fulfil yourself, become all that you might be, at least in principle. Um, so that's one of the great ups. And of course, uh, health as well. Um, always remember toothache in the medieval period, not very nice. Um, but it leads to the great crises of our time now, which are particularly coming acute, I think. There is the mental health crisis, um, which I think is growing more and more and more. And we now are very, very key, uh, conscious of the climate crisis too. I think it's not fundamentally an economic problem, although no doubt um, economics will have to come to play. We'll have to reorganise our economies um, to meet the crisis. But I think we'll only really know how to do that when we treat it not as a moral problem, but as a spiritual problem. That when we can awaken once more to relating to the world not as I it, but as I thou. When we can really know that keenly in ourselves, the rest will sort of follow, I think. Um, but of course it's no mean ask. So I put this figure up as well as, as it were. We're, we're looking at the top of the world, back in, wondering how to descend through the clouds, you might say.
Barfield called this final participation, a new kind of reciprocal participation. And you might ask, you know, how are we going to go about it? Um, I've partly indicated, I think, by relating to, particularly as Christians, to the scriptures in a different way and to the figure of Jesus in a different way. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I really am keen on this. I think morality is a fruit, not a root. And we must focus on the roots um, of, our, of what it is to be a Christian, which is this seeing with eyes, hearing with, with ears, being awoken through our engagement and with the kingdom that's here already. Um, I think interior life really matters in this task. Uh, I would say this, I'm a psychotherapist. In, in retrospect, I realise now it's one of the reasons I became a psychotherapist. I was actually having a crisis at the time, so that's what led me into it. Um, but nonetheless, I can see there was a kind of uh, fortuitousness in that, if no more. Um, so the point I think about learning about our inner life, however you do it, whether it's through therapy or other means, is that you start to realise that there's more going on inside you than just your sense of self. There are forces that were in play in your psyche that actually come from the outside in. Um, they may be uh, inherited from your family, which if you can, as it were, not spend your whole time sort of fending them off, but start to learn how to relate to them. Part of the liberation of that is not just that you feel happier, you, you perhaps lose a couple of neuroses, um, but also life becomes richer. Um, life expands for you because you start to realise it's not just you in isolation as a splendid self, but it's you already immersed in, a, in with others, but with the key difference that you've still got your sense of self. You're not lost um, in this immersive uh, experience anymore, as I think perhaps happened under original participation. You don't, as it were, have to start performing libations to your parents and ancestors um, like they did before. You as an individual can learn how to relate to yourself, to others, to nature, to the cosmos, to God. Um, your individuality is preserved and becomes a new place, I think like Jesus, it's a new manifestation of the incarnation um, to everything else that's going on around you. And I think there are signs, to wrap this up now, I think there are signs that suggest um, when we're on this path, as well as doing the interior work, um, and when we notice them, I, I try and do this now, I try and really take them in, learn from them, get this felt sense of what, what this might be like, because I think that this is the kingdom, me realising the kingdom now. Um, our experience of time changes, I think. Um, it, this is a picture from Dante's Divine Comedy where um, uh, date Dante uh, is, is ascending into purgatory where time starts to shift in very interesting ways in the story. And particularly what starts to happen is you realise there's not just clock time. Um, there's various levels of time. And in particular, there's even hints that in the depth of your soul is eternity. There's a kind of timelessness. I learnt this in therapy actually because I realised that things that had happened to me actually from the very earliest days of my life, which I had no memory of, but had to ask by asking my parents, they were still alive inside me in quite extraordinary ways. There's a kind of eternity to us, um, which um, we notice when time starts to apparently play tricks on us, but actually I think is entering a kind of divine experience of time too. And the point is that we, we, you, get, you develop more flexibility, you can move across these different experiences of time, which is what Dante has to learn to, go, to do as he rises through purgatory and then into paradise. I think matter starts to change its meaning to you. Um, if you think about it, there's, there's something slightly odd about, certainly the implicit, I think, I'm not doing any, I hope I'm not doing too much injustice here, about the standard Christian approach to us, nature, and God, which is sort of that there's us that's alive, there's God that's alive, but most of the world is sort of these dead mechanisms that are just kind of chugging away and doing their thing um, according to standard science. But I think this is changing now. I put trees um, on, on, the, on the image because trees seem to be um, organisms in our culture where we're starting to realise there may be more to these trees than just very sophisticated um, machines devised by Darwinian evolution. Um, I read an article the other day in a mainstream newspaper that asked how do trees experience time? You know, that would have never got commissioned even five years ago. But now, books about trees are big bucks um, because we're so fascinated by the inner life of trees, the secret life of trees. And so I think this is one way where we're starting to realise, starting to really experience, not just posit, but really starting to experience um, the inner life of nature and the cosmos once more. I think we need to pay a lot more attention to angels and miracles and synchronicities and the paranormal. Um, I, I've been delighted to go to the new Blake exhibition at Tate uh, Britain because there you get like a flood um, of all sorts of bizarre imagery. But if you, rather than trying to sort of, as it were, decipher it and render it into some sort of literal form, some sort of moral tale, but just let the image speak to you, 
it starts to catalyse a capacity to see the world in a different way. And I particularly like referencing Blake because he is our local mystic here in South London. You know, if he saw angels on Peckham Rye, then it must be possible for us to as well. Um, and I think we need to start taking seriously these sometimes little intimations, little synchronicities, sometimes full-on confusing chaotic paranormal experiences. And the point is that we now need to learn to relate to them from our sense of self so that we can discern them and start to learn how to relate to them more fully. Um, this too, I think, is a, much, a really crucial part of, of moving into the kingdom, which I'd love to see us engaging with more. Um, it, it happens in therapy. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing which, that's the way I learned about it. I think we need to learn completely new ways of understanding growth. This is particularly important, I think, in our culture. Um, I think that the call for, like, zero growth economies is, is never going to work because we human beings are the beings that long for the infinite. We just, that's not going to change. Um, and what modern capitalism, you might say, has done in its genius, has channeled all that desire into material desire, so that we now just think of material growth. But here's another image from Dante's Divine Comedy. Another thing which Dante learns as he rises through the heavens is that there's a whole different other kind of growth that's possible, what you might call spiritual growth. And in particular, it's not a growth that's based on accumulation. It's a growth that's based on discovery. And he realises that he's already got it within him. And when he, the more and more that he sees of this, this richness, this glory that he already possesses, the higher he's able to go through the heavens because he can see more. And I think that there's a massive amount of work to be done on new, different kinds of growth, recovering a kind of sense of spiritual growth, which has a very, very different logic from the material growth that otherwise utterly determines the lives that we have, particularly at the level of the economy. We need to think about freedom in different ways as well. I've already talked about the Good Samaritan. There is no doubt a moral side to Christianity, but I think unless it's rooted in the sense that we're free beings to act well in the world, as I think was the case um, with um, the Good Samaritan, we're not going to get it. And, you know, again, freedom is such a crucial notion for our culture because it basically means freedom of choice, freedom to determine your own laws, um, things which aren't necessarily bad in themselves, but if they're taken to be the whole of freedom, things go wrong. Um, you get clashes between different choices, you get clashes between different polities, as we're experiencing now. But if, it's just, if that's just a reflection of a divine freedom to know who you are in yourself, to be free in this life, um, to take all sorts of risks, like the Good Samaritan, then it just eases up that pressure, as well as, I think, being very good for us as individuals. We need to think about pluralism, I think, in the modern world as well. Another thing which Dante discovers as he rises through the heavens, here he is in the heaven of Jupiter, and he sees these five figures on the kind of divine eagle. And he realises that there are pagans in heaven, and this is rather disturbing to him. Um, uh, but it's part of his uh, journey. Re he has to start to let go a lot of what Christianity had previously taught him in order that he can discover an even more glorious vision of what it might mean to know God. Um, and I think that this is another very sort of profound... Um, part of our task now, to know how to relate to others um, in this way. A, a, a key insight is also in Paradise for Dante, when he realises that all the souls he meets are completely themselves, he recognises them as people, and yet their will, their desire, um, their sight, um, their very life is absolutely completely working in a kind of glorious divine harmony, um, so that the one and the many are completely and beautifully brought together. And I think this is a kind of key idea for pluralism as we move forward, that we need to not, as it were, be talking about people as anonymous Christians or saying, you know, getting all that kind of awkwardness. And we need to realise that in, in paradise, the vision is of the, the enormously diverse, um, harmonised together in, in this one unity, because will, because desire, because sight, even though it comes from different places, different cultures, different experiences, ultimately is looking on to the same thing, gazing in the same thing. Um, Pluralism is another key, key part of our task now. I'm getting towards the end. Science, I think, has got to change. And I think there's something particularly to learn from the old ways of understanding the angels. So here's a depiction in an icon of the hierarchies of angels. I think, broadly speaking, we need to think not just that there's we as people and then there's God as some sort of divine person too, but that personhood really is the fundamental principle right the way through nature. Um, and the old way of talking about this was to talk about the powers and principalities, the intelligences um, which are holding, shaping, forming, sustaining nature. Um, every so often in modern science you get a, 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 a hint of it. Um, so, for example, Einstein makes these rather gnomic comments about realising that he's just glimpsing 
an intelligence which is just a fragment of the intelligence which must underscore the whole cosmos that he sees. My old physics tutor um, in Durham, Carlos Frank, he says something quite similar. Um, the, the older he gets, as it were, the more he realises that his intelligence is just a reflection of whatever intelligence is that there in the cosmos. Because if it wasn't there in the cosmos, he realises he wouldn't have a notion of what's going on at all. Um, so I think we've got to recover this, this different sense of science as well. This is a big ask. But actually, another... Um, hopeful sign I've had this week is there's been these short programs on the radio about romantic traditions in science, trying to bring the arts and the sciences together. And quite often you get intimations of this. I think there's a kind of mood for it, maybe precipitated by the ecological crisis as well. We realise we can't treat nature as a machine anymore. anymore. We've got to discover its inner life once again. And here, almost my final slide, is the key faculty which I think we have now, which again is a kind of modern faculty, it didn't really exist in the same way in the ancient world, which is the notion of the imagination. And this is why, again, Blake is such a key thing, because he was right onto it. Um, he said, I know of no other Christianity, of no other gospel, than the liberty, both of body and mind, to exercise the divine arts of imagination. He, he's uh, reflecting the same sentiment of Coleridge, figures like Thomas Traherne in the Anglican tradition, um, uh, the, the, the intoxication of Blake, you might say, someone called it the sober intoxication of Blake. Um, and I think the idea is that what happens with the imagination, you see, is that it reaches out from within us, and sometimes it's just sheer fantasy. It's mistaken, it's foolish, and we make mistakes with our imagination, what Coleridge called fantasy, rather than imagination proper. But every so often, it lands, as it were, on the world around us, or it lands on someone, and our perception of them actually is right. And then what happens is not only do we see them or the world around us more vividly, but our souls expand too. Life expands for us as well. And you get a second moment, which is a kind of inspiration, a taking in that's coming from the world or from others around you. Your spirit, as it were, fills out as you take in what's returned when this imagination is right. So you get this, this, this binary movement of outer and then inwards once more. And it forms into um, what a Barkfield called a new intuition, which is a new sight of the way the world actually is, from which you're increasingly able to live from. Um, and to put it in the very explicit Christian sense, I think this is living from the kingdom. Your life, as it were, has become realigned so that your, your I amness is now in the service and aligned with the divine I am, rather than just as it were wrestling with itself um, in the struggle from before. So these are sort of, as it were, for me, uh, like hints of the kingdom, you might say, signs of the kingdom, um, new experiences of time, of matter, of miracles, of growth, of freedom, of pluralism, of science, and this new sense of incarnation. Um, as well, which I think matters so much for our times. Now, I think I've spoken for an hour. Um, it is in the book at greater length if you want to contemplate on that. 